Okay, so uh, today I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jody Axelson, and uh, and I'll just go ahead and with your bio. All right, so Dr. Jody Axelson is an interdisciplinary scientist based in Victoria, British Columbia, and conducts applied research by drawing on fields of forestry, applied ecology, entomology, dendrochronology, and wood anatomy, and I'm sure probably more too. Uh, Jody is the research lead in silviculture for the BC Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resource Operation, and Rural Development. Jody is also the president of the Tree Ring Society and is a wonderful example of everything a scientist can aspire to be. She achieves as a published scientist, uh, has worked her way up in and out of academia, and gives back as an amazing person and an ever supportive, supportive mentor to others. It is my privilege to get to chat with and welcome uh, Jody to Fireside Chats. Thanks so much for the invite, Joe. I was really excited to get it, actually. I was like, yay, Fireside Chat. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, it started as like, uh, you know, me trying to really, really pull some people in. You know, it's really nice to, you know, have people wanting to be part because they're seeing and getting to connect with people that maybe they know or they know of. And uh, yeah, so it's really cool to have you be part because, yeah, you've been on my list. You know, I had this list of people that I was like, oh, man, you know, like these 30 people, you know, or whatever it was, probably like 80 people. You know, I really want to get them sometime. And you were definitely one of them. So, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Mm -hmm. And now that you're here, I'll go ahead and start by asking you just kind of start with just telling us uh, who you are, um, what Jody does on a day to day and how you got there, because I know there's, you know, a whole life history, and you can start wherever you like, or leave out whatever you want to, it's your story to tell. Yeah, it's probably gonna be a long and rambling answer, like I feel like my life is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia today, which actually is on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, and, you know, we're in an interesting space in British Columbia. Um, the government and sort of socially about recognizing, you know, through the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so acknowledgements feel a little, um, to me, a little like we're saying something nice, but it actually, I'm coming around to the, to this idea that it's, it, it's important to acknowledge our like settler colonialism um, as, uh, you know, as a white woman, I grew up in, in the interior of British Columbia and, and my parents actually on my mom's side, she was the first generation to be born in Canada. So, you know, my grandparents were born in various places in Europe. And so I do think it's an important acknowledgement. And I think I am not necessarily, I don't know how to proceed, but, uh, that equity in science and how you do our how we do our science, which are on these traditional and unceded territories, and how we engage really meaningfully and not like just through an acknowledgement per se, is something that's on my mind a lot. Although I don't know really how to move forward because I'm a tree ring scientist and I look at forestry and I look at insects. And so, you know, I think science is interesting because it constantly puts you outside of your comfort zone and that could be in the statistics you're running it could be in thinking about that greater picture about where you fit in the world and and acknowledging the inequities that are all around us you know on multiple fronts um it could be you know your employer there's just so many places to be uncomfortable in science and i like that it can get a little tiring when, when you're uncomfortable a lot. Yeah. And so I've been kind of on the move a lot lately. I feel like I've been back in Victoria for a year, just over a year. Um, but before that I was in Berkeley before that I was finishing a PhD and in a really small community called Williams Lake in British Columbia. And in all of these different roles, I've sort of worn a different hat where people sort of see me in a particular light. In Williams Lake, I was an entomologist. Um, 
here I'm a civil culture research leader. Um, Berkeley was sort of the most holistic in that I was a, a, an extension professor in forest health. And so forest health was maybe the best label because I don't really like labels, which goes back yeah. to my interdisciplinarity because so much forest health is, is a catch-all for our lot. You can be looking at drought, at insects, at fire, at forest management regimes, and ultimately how they impact forests. And that's the thing I like the most. You know, how does the environment influence or push on forests? How do they react? And if you're able to look at them long enough, do they resist the, the stressor? Do they, are they resilient to the stressor? Um, but I think you need time to look at that, which is why tree rings are so awesome. So that's kind of a brief uh, story of why I'm sitting in Victoria at this present moment. Um, yeah. No, that was great. No, it, and you touched, I, I love that you started with the land acknowledgement and, you know, it, it really is something that, um, it is, I, I would say I am in that place of just absolute absorption and learning um, that I have so much. I, I think I'm at a place where I realized how much I need to learn and how much potential I have to grow into that space. Um, I've been wanting to do land acknowledgement on uh, all the fireside chats and Oklahoma, um, as you probably know, has a very complicated history with mm -hmm. land. Um, ownership uh if you will i hate using land ownership but it is what you know it's understood to be and you know we had um forced migration um resettlement of so many different tribes and nations of people um throughout the history of the united states uh in canada obviously but um you know, Oklahoma is, was really like what they tried to do is just make it this melting pot of, you know, where everybody who was indigenous from the east was forced here. And uh, at one point in time, you know, that was, that was the, the attempt at least. And so now, you know, trying to tease apart, and this is where I really need to do a lot of work at getting with indigenous scholars um, and uh, elders and people who are knowledgeable of, of their people and their culture and the history of what's happened in Oklahoma. Um, because, you know, I know of like Osage and uh, Potawatomi people and, uh, you know, there, there were so many different tribes that were here as kind of the plains, you know, tribes. Um, and it, a lot of it was uh, highly like migratorial, you know, here at hunting seasons and, you know, and then not. And, you know, I just don't know. So, uh, I'm so glad that you brought that up because that is a crucial piece that needs to be uh, explored more by myself. So I guess I kind of went into a whole tangent about that, but it, it deserves it. Right. And so yeah, it I'm, does. I'm, glad, and it's not, I'm glad you brought that up. It's not easy to approach necessarily. Like, as you say, there is this amalgamation through, you know, the history of what happened with displacement um, of Indigenous peoples in the U.S. And so it's not straightforward. It's not straightforward here either, where less of that happened um, in, the, in the Arctic communities that happened more. But in, in British Columbia, I would, I would say that um, nations were not moved great distances around. They, they have existed and continue to exist in their traditional territories, obviously in a completely different way. But yeah, yeah it's... Uh, it's, it's, it is really important and I, I'm wanting to spend more attention thinking and, and learning, actually learning. I have a lot to learn about that space um, because I don't want to, you know, you don't want to do something wrong, basically. Yeah. You don't want to offend people. You don't want to, yeah. you know, and working with the government adds a little bit of a, uh, an extra layer to that yeah yeah right? layers because i'm representing the yeah. government and i'm working right. on behalf of the peoples of this entire province and so that feels a little more tricky but it's yeah. something i want to do yeah no for sure and you know like you know i i think it's so important for um i think white people tend to be with our white fragility right like we tend to be fragile in the other sense that um if we're more on kind of that progressive bent that 
it, you know, I hate that it's even for, it should just be a, a, just a normal human thing as we try to be more human and uh, humane about how we treat people and their history. Um, we tend to be fragile in the sense of not wanting to talk about this openly. And, you know, cause you know, I, I fully believe that I'm probably right in assuming that you and I, these two white people here, don't want to step on toes. We don't want to offend. And we want to be very careful that we say the right tribal names, the right, represent the right, you know, nations to the history of the land and all. all. And so I know I'll make mistakes and I apologize for those mistakes. Um, but if two white people aren't going to sit here and talk about these things, um, then what are we? Are we relying on Native Americans, uh, indigenous people to tell us their history? Like exactly. that's our job. We need to be pursuing it. We need to be talking about it and normalizing these conversations that are, you know, yeah, they're delicate, but really like we just need to learn more and then we can talk about it better. So thank you for, thank you for that. Thanks for this discussion. Cause it needs to happen more often. And I definitely acknowledge, you know, it's, it is, it's extra layer and complexity uh, for you, you know, being a representative of, of Canadian government too. Yeah. You know, it's, we see so often the people doing the work, the people most disproportionately impacted by diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion issues are shouldering the lion's share of the work in the space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what really needs to change. Um, and uh, when I, you know, I've been involved in the Tree Ring Society since, oh, I forget the year, but maybe 2016, I started as the vice president. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And it's a great group of volunteers that work on that executive council. And, and we try to, you know, for an international tree ring society, try to um, represent the mission of the society, which is education and dendrochronology and research and dendrochronology really, really fairly. And and well, and also acknowledge, you know, the tide change around us. And so yeah we started the, the, we had the recognition that we needed to advance our own policies on professional conduct, harassment and bullying and, and enter into that DEI space. I think as yeah. physical scientists, you know, we go, oh, well, folks in the humanities are dealing kind of with that, right? Yeah, right. It's not something we really need to talk about. We're a really you know, we're a really nice, inclusive community, like we're good. Yeah. But it actually bears like thoughtful exploration of like what we need to do, what we hold our members to account. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's been in my thinking broadly in the scope of dendrochronology and then also how I interact in the world as, you know, Jody you know, like a daughter, sister, wife, uh, beagle owner, gardener, and then as like a scientist, yeah. um, you know, and, and all those spaces in between. Yeah, no, I like that. I mean, that's, it's about bringing your whole self uh, everywhere you go, um, being open, being vulnerable uh, in, in a place that also holds boundaries, obviously, you know, where they need to be. Uh, yeah, I love that you brought up, you know, the Tree Ring Society as well, um, because, you know, it was about right. It was actually a couple of years before uh, you became on the council is to my understanding um, that, you know, we had kind of the shakedown go across because of, you know, um, the guy who, you know, really was just awful and did a lot of horrible things. Um, and and that as as a person coming into it, uh you know, I'm not a vulnerable person in the sense that I'm a white guy in my thirties, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm not bringing a lot of, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of hurt, you know, and a lot of vulnerability there, but you know, it was, it was really, um, such a crucial time that I came in and then seeing like what the new council or what I presume to be kind of the sea change that occurred and saying, we're going to talk about this. We're going to be open about it. We're going to make rules. We're going to, make this at the forefront of our efforts uh in how we move forward as a tree as the tree ring society and i love the efforts that you've led and been part of and the entire council um 
and really trying to make that a more diverse, a more equitable space, uh, a safer space for everybody. Because now it's a place that I fully, you know, enthusiastically, you know, tell people like, yeah, you need to join, you need to be part of this, you know. Um, although I haven't been to any of the events or anything yet, uh, it's still something that I know so many people enjoy uh, being part of. So, yeah, I just want to acknowledge those efforts and, yeah. and you know got to lead that charge. You know, you can't wait for somebody else to do it. And, and I'm glad to see that you, you know, haven't done that. You haven't waited. Well, as a plug for Ameridendro 2022, mm-hmm. everybody is so going to be wanting to see each other in person. Like yeah. there has been um, sort of a leveling in a in a sense this last year with everything being remote. Like I'm going to university of Arizona, laboratory of Turing science lunch talks, right? Yeah, I'm going, right. you know, to a UFRO, um, tree mortality lectures very early in the morning. Um, mm-hmm. And so there is this sort of, in a sense, a democratization, if you've got a decent internet connection, yeah. and you can, you know, access this knowledge and these, um, these voices. Yet at the same time, there's this like, uh, long-term stressor of not actually being able to see your colleagues and interact um, in the way, you know, that I think humans are sort of hardwired to interact. And so I think a Meridendro can be amazing in that way because it tends to be a smaller meeting. It's very Dendro focused, but then it's like the tent that brings in all of the, you know, because Dendro itself is so interdisciplinary. It covers yeah. this incredible array of, of work, you know? Um, and so what joins us all together is the fact that we use tree rings to explore the, the territories and the issues. And so I've, I've been to all the Ameridendros actually, and they've all been incredible. And it's actually like my favorite meeting, you know, the really, really big meetings. I'm kind of, I'm kind of done with those. It just feels too yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, I know for sure. So uh, Ameridendro, that's, is that going to be in Montreal? It's going to be in Montreal, Quebec in 2022 in in June. Okay. And so, yeah, that's exciting. And I think they're, the planning committee is sort of trying to stage it to go coincide with the Montreal Jazz Festival. Oh, which cool. Which is like a free and open public space event. The yeah, campus yeah. is downtown in Montreal. So then you're sort of right at that interface. Very cool. You know, and, and, you know, if we are where we think we hope to be in, the summer of 2022, I think everybody will be relishing that public, yeah. you know, that being in public space and being in community again. Yeah, and I really sure. value that about Denver chronology. I find it a really rich community and I think it can only get richer by dealing with these issues of diversity, inclusion and equity, as we were just talking about. Right. But yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. I, well said. And yeah, that's, Sounds like a very exciting event, you know, and for, you know, I think everybody, I mean, that's what, you know, as far as these fires, my chats is just like, man, I miss people like, and, and, you know, as somebody who is, you know, pretty introverted, you know, but I like to get out and mingle with people too. Uh, yeah. I miss seeing faces and, you know, touching people, just being in the same space. So yeah. Exactly. What a cool time for people who, um, yeah, I want to celebrate, you know, and people that are into dendrochronology, you know, they tend to have some, a lot of like similar characteristics and things they like, uh, you know, hobby wise, you know, being outdoors, doing lots of field work, you know, more field yeah. oriented, not all of them, but most of them. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, camaraderie for sure. And I look forward to seeing that expand, you know, for yeah, sure too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, and yeah I, think field too. Work. I actually get to go to the field today. Oh, cool. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. See, excited. you just you like lit up because like, oh, the field. I love the field. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. So, what are you what are you doing today? Uh, generally speaking, or whatever. I don't want to like intrude. So we have what we call EPs. They're called experimental projects all around the province, <clears throat> looking at different types of questions. And we have a number on sort of southern central Vancouver Island. Uh, well, they're all over the province, but the ones we're focused on in this study are in southern uh, central Vancouver Island, and we're, they're, they're old fertilization uh, trials where the trees are roughly about 40, 50 years old, 
And within this experiment, everything is planted at a fairly regular spacing and paired trees are fertilized or not fertilized. Mm. And they're considered pairs experimentally because they have similar crown areas, heights, DBHs. It's all single species. It's all Douglas fir in this particular experiment. Okay. And so we're the BC government's a member of the stand management co-op which is a large uh, research and development cooperative housed under the University of Washington and has membership in Washington um, and Oregon, British Columbia. And so there's these studies across mainly the kind of the coastal region. There's also studies in the interior, but the work we're involved in in the BC government side tends to be on our coastal installations. Okay. And so we're collecting these cores for one of the PIs in the F in the SMCs. We're collecting these tree cores. Who's going to be looking physiologically at this sort of fertilization response? Oh, in this okay. sort of non-fertilized individual and a fertilized individual looking at carbon, um, looking at sort of isotopes and early wood, late wood, et cetera. So I go out with a technician I work with who has me using a drill bit on the incline oh. core, which I do not know how I feel about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think you post, did you post a photo of I that? I posted a yeah. picture because we're sampling at DBH and my, my beef about forestry is why did it have to be a tall German or French guy that <laughs> yeah. set up DBH? <laughs> that wasn't DBH very equitable, was it? This height. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's no leverage up there. Even yeah. manually is a pain at that height, but using like a drill, like a yeah. drill and eat. Not so great. Luckily, um, the technician I work with, um, his breast height is, he's tall. So yeah, yeah. he yeah. does a lot of the coring with this drill. Uh, I do the, uh, the straw. I'm the straw bagger. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're the tech in this, in this case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I wondered, you know, cause I, I've thought about buying a chuck, you know, to, to fit. And I just thought, Hmm, I don't know. Like there's, there's part of like, uh, I know tons of people do it. Like I know people do it. Um, yeah. but, uh, for me, I just, I think maybe I just need to just do it and try it, but I just feel like, Oh, do you, you know, cause it may, you know, obviously like, uh, manage trees, you know, uh, plantation style, you know, obviously yeah. that's different. Um, you're not really probably worried about hitting some hollow pocket, but for me, like coring some 200 plus year old Oak trees, you know, uh, here in the south I, I worry about you know would I would I feel it would I yeah get boars stuck and have to retrieve them so anyways I would say that's a consideration you know we got uh Dave got the boar really stuck because you can't feel that softening yep. in yeah, the core and, gives, you know these yeah. are soft wood so it's also not putting a lot of torque on the actual increment core. yeah and yeah. they're small trees so you're using a short a short increment bore. Yeah, You know, it definitely makes things faster. I think it has its place, but I am kind of old fashioned. I like analog. Yeah, I do too. Um, I do too. To, to my benefit or hindrance, I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly. Like part Rule of the whole of thing about field work is sort of the quietness, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, in my master's days where I was doing um, like dendrohydrology, you know, was that hiking around looking for those beautiful old trees yeah. on you know those west and southwest facing slopes and you know cozying up on a cliffside to a limber pond figuring out where you could actually get a solid core and yeah um, of course in forestry that work changes a little bit because of the experimental designs of things are quite yeah. quite different than a dendroclimatic approach but yeah yeah that's still really cool work i mean yeah. like it, that'd be really interesting to see what comes out of that seeing what tree ring responses to untreated and fertilized plots that's pretty or trees that's pretty cool yeah Uh, it's always cool like it's always fascinating to see what somebody's doing with tree rings you know because there's just so many so many different options sorry i I keep i keep swatting at mosquitoes that are okay so it's that time (laughs) i i don't i don't know i might have a mosquito net for the next fireside chat so (laughs) yeah well that's cool work uh so i did want to ask you too so what um that transition that you did from you you came from California to back to BC, right? Yeah. So what you know what was what kind of prompted that, or what what kind of led you to kind of be doing the leading the group that you're doing now? 
Yeah, it's funny. You know, I was still doing my PhD. I was in that classic ABD um, limbo land, the all but dissertation. Yeah. Working yep. full time as a forest entomologist um, in a region of British Columbia that was really hit by mountain pine beetle. So they were mm. like, please don't let any bugs kill the trees. So very yeah. active on the forest management side and kind of monitoring insect populations. So, you know, slugging through trying to get this dissertation fully written. Yeah. And I see this job at UC Berkeley for a cooperative extension specialist. I didn't even know really what that meant because we don't have the land grant system or the extension mission in the community okay. system. I see. But I read this description, which I think I saw on ResearchGate or somewhere like pretty random. Huh. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the inside of my brain written on paper. <laughs> I have to apply. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I apply, you know, all my degrees are in geography okay. from Canadian institutions and not like the big Canadian institutions people think of like UBC or McGill or University of Toronto, pretty small right. schools. So I just sort of throw this in on a lark because what they seem to want is highly aligned to what I can do. And I forget about it. And lo and behold, get interviewed and brought down to Berkeley, do that, you know, had my bag my interview two day full day craziness like packed like I'm, I was running a marathon right you know so like when I could escape to the bathroom hoping nobody would follow me into the bathroom to keep <laughs> chatting to me uh I could sort of like refuel with yeah. caffeine and various things <laughs> just um, survive through it right survive through it exactly so do that kind of go wow I think I killed it that's pretty crazy right yeah come home back to BC and get offered the job. That's cool. Yeah. Which is just like, oh my God, you cannot say no to a job at University of California, Berkeley. In right. that intervening time, figured out what the heck I was going to be doing, what the role of an <laughs> extension specialist or an extension professor is in this cooperative extension world. Went down um, at the end of the kind of the California drought. It was at the summer of it was the summer of 2016, I guess. Mm. Got down there and uh, and all the trees are turning red. And Californians had never really experienced a bark beetle outbreak before. Like, oh, wow. There, there have been little discrete outbreaks in the San Bernardino Mountains yeah. in the Transverse Range. <clears throat> the 1930s, there was a large bark beetle outbreak throughout the Sierra Nevada, but of course nobody remembers that. And so right. everybody's losing their minds, right? They're used to wildfire as a disturbance. They're not used to this one, two punch of drought and then massive tree mortality due to bark beetles. Yeah. So boom, extension, like full year, just like these are native bark beetles. This is what's happening. Don't plant Norway spruce on your property. Like, because you're afraid of bark beetles killing your trees. Yeah. Yeah. And an amazing, amazing position. Um, you know, Trump got in four months after we started the position. So that felt pretty rough, mm -hmm. um, especially because our own conservative government in Canada had just ended and we were in a, in a more uh, liberal or Democrat uh, run administration. Right. So it sort of survived the Harper years only to arrive to the very end of the Obama years and like live through the Trump years. Yeah. Yeah. Complete opposite. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I found such collegiality and, great mentorship and great colleagues at Berkeley, but ultimately it was the, you know, it's the ultimate life question. Like, what do I do when my partner doesn't want to be here? Mm. What do I do when my family is all in British Columbia? So yeah. as I tear up about, you know, leaving Berkeley, but. Yeah, yeah. So this opportunity with the BC government came up and it was like, okay, this is a, like a solid stepping stone to maintain a research scientist position mm -hmm. in BC. Um, we own a house in Victoria, BC, which we managed to keep all those years in different locations wow. kind of stringing along. And it was like, I can't turn, you know, I can't say no to this because, you know, the work side of my life is really full the life side of my life or the personal side of my life is really low. Yeah. And so can I balance those? And so that was the sort of the impetus to come home. Mm -hmm. um, so we did. 
then pandemia came along like three months later. Yeah. And um, obviously we've all lived through that. That's been pretty crazy. And so it's been pretty nice to be in my home with my partner um, yeah. and, and not doing that long distance thing all the time, et cetera. Um, I still don't see my nieces and nephews and extended family. And that's a yep. major bummer, but nobody could have anticipated um, COVID. And so, yeah. so that was sort of the, like the catalyst. And, you know, if anyone was to look at my CV, they'd go, oh yeah, she sort of publishes, but man, there, you know, does a lot of service and does a lot of yeah. this. And I am service oriented in some, at, at, at a fundamental level in my character. Um, which is why I take on service work because I think it's really important. I think it's the foundation upon which all of the other things stand and working with the government can be frustrating, but you know, you are also performing a service to your um, community, your, your province and forestry is at a real crux moment here in British Columbia. And so to be part of knowledge generation and really keeping the uh, the science-based decision-making present in the office of the chief forester, which on paper it is, right? Yeah. You know, but, but everybody's just drowning in work and force management's changing very quickly. And so it really does take almost that advocacy role of, what, what information do you need as a decision maker? How can I fill that? What decisions are you trying to make? Okay, let me go find the information that relates to that, that is scientifically yeah. founded and robust. Um, and so it is a different, it is different, but it feels worthwhile. Mm -hmm. It feels hard some days. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I it's only Wednesday, so. but this week's been kicking my butt. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sorry the week's kicking your butt, but I, I'm glad that you're doing the role that you're doing. You know, I I definitely understand uh, at least that idea of needing to be that liaison between the policymakers or decision makers and, uh, the you know, the people on the ground and kind of linking it all together is such a taxing position to be in. Um because you're essentially fielding directives on one hand that must be met somehow and then having to make key decisions that are going to affect people in real life, whether they're just members in the community or the people that are working in that industry or in that government space too. That's, that's a lot of pressure and it's a lot of stress and it's a lot of work to be done, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Huh. It is. But then I get to go on the into the field, like on days, like, today and spend my day in a pretty remote piece of forest in the, on the yeah. mid coast there, uh, mid Island taking tree course. Yeah, no, that's cool. That part's awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, that helps kind of temper the whole thing and, and allow you to, to have kind of that nature outlet, you know, instead of just being in a, I guess, purely policy or, strategic you know role or something like that so i'm glad you get i'm glad you get to get a lot out among the trees a little bit exactly you know if i was to say anything to my younger self you know i'm glad i did the phd for sure and mm. it's a been a great career of working in really different areas and and connecting with problems and people in a really rich way but I don't get to measure tree rings anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to class yourself out of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You train people and that's rewarding. But it's like some days it'd just be great to sit in front of C. Dendro or uh, my eyes up at a microscope measuring yeah. tree rings. I miss that. Yeah. Well, maybe I just need to uh, do some cores for you and I'll send them to you for analysis. How about that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> No, please, please no. <laughs> please, so, no. Sounds good, but no, <laughs> not today. Um, thank, I, thanks so much, Jody, for sharing like your personal experience because you know 
I, I feel like in, in like these chats with people, everybody's had like these really, um, whether they shared them on here or not, everybody knows that everybody has had a life that they live behind the science and that often doesn't get told. And, you know, these chats are pri- they're for whoever wants to watch them, but they're primarily for me. And then they're primarily for everyone else, like the scientists. And, and, you know, there's so many, like, you know, there's been postdocs, there's been, you know, PhD graduates and um, everything, you know, all on both sides of that. And it's so important to tell these human stories. I feel like uh, the struggles of, you know, all the stressors and moving for positions that you love and then needing to move again because we're not just isolated scientists and that's, there's so much more to us than that. And, um, I love chatting with you because you're clearly not like that, uh, stereotypical, you know, lab coat scientists that they're just, uh, facts and figures and, and no personality, you know, and, uh, you, you have a heart and I'm glad it leads you, you know? So yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing your stories because that's, so important to normalize that struggle yeah exactly you know I really enjoy engaging like on Twitter for example which I I do very um I try to really keep it into the forest science realm you know and and related categories um but I follow scientists I'm I'm followed by lots of people but I'm only mainly tweet about science but what you never what you rarely see I won't say never what you rarely see in a space like Twitter are the days where you're like weeping over a mixed effects model. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. like literally blowing the dust off uh, your last PhD chapter, which I'm working on yeah. now. And it's like, yeah, yeah. and that feeling of like, you know, is this shame I'm feeling because this is from, you know, I collected these tree rings in 2012 and is it too late? And what you tend to get are the you know the popular news stories or this is our new paper and some days it feels like really like oh I can't I can't be on Twitter today I'm just like everybody is like killing it <laughs> yeah 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 and I'm gonna, for sure. gonna work for the government end my day at 4 30 and go garden and get that squash planted <laughs> yeah that's right no that's so true that's so true and I can relate to that uh I'm kind of in you know, not the last chapter or anything like that, but I'm still very much, you know, I've got a lot of writing to do for my master's thesis and I've taken all the classes done all that. And, but the stress of having that hanging over me, I'm going to get it done. I want to get it done, but I also have to survive and I also have to make money. And I also have to make sure my kids and, you know, partner are happy. And then we're thinking about, well, do we need to move? Do we need to sell the house? Cause the market's so good, you know, these yeah. are live stories that are happening and impact everything. And exactly. like you said, you get on Twitter and it's like, well, everybody's succeeding. <laughs> Good yeah. for everybody in their science. <laughs> and then you get on the phone and you're like, oh, wow, cool. Your life's a beep show too. Like, yeah. thank God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Everybody's struggling. And that's what I love. Like every time I've gone to the doctor or taken my kids to the doctor or chatted with whoever and like everybody is telling everybody right now and i don't know when the last time in history if anybody ever did do this i love how everybody is just saying like everybody's struggling right now these are just hard times right now and it really helps people uh you know i think compassionate people really understand if i'm struggling with this how much more so are the people who are you know um you know, more afflicted in society and by societal norms. So yeah, yeah, it it brings a lot of understanding and compassion for sure. For sure. Okay. How about some questions? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. All right. I'm going to start you off with the traditional, I feel, I feel like after 20 chats, I can now say, say I have a tradition. So traditional first question is what is your favorite tree? You know, does it have to be one? No, it could be whatever. You can talk <laughs> about five or or you can just talk about whatever. It doesn't matter. You know what? I will say I do have a favorite and it's really pedestrian, which always is slightly embarrassing. But I love me some Douglas fir. 
I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I worked with him in my master's. It's got this incredible, and my PhD almost exclusively, it's got this incredible range, mm -hmm. you know, from like discontinuous at around what, 54 degrees latitude all the way down to, I don't know, 29. Yeah. yeah. Actually, something that's in got this incredible breadth. And so it's this tree that's like inherently so like, plastic and and, yeah. and of its environment it lives centuries it's it's tough as nails but you like rub it the wrong way in a harvesting operation it is gone it is dead so it's incredibly sensitive yeah you know, i just i just love the douglas fir i have to say yeah yeah so incredibly tough but yet very sensitive it sounds a lot like you doesn't it yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> All right. Uh, what is your favorite fireside food and beverage? Fireside food and beverage, uh, beer, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, blessed on the West Coast with just a, a absolute plethora, yeah. ridiculous buffet of craft beer. Uh huh. So, yeah, I'm jealous. Um, I'm jealous. Yeah. I, I will say a plug for Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma has really come along. They, they've got a lot of little microbreweries and stuff like that, but it's definitely not the West Coast. And I love cider, and I hear that you all have amazing cider in the Pacific Northwest. And yeah, you know, yeah, good else. apple growing country. Actually, I was in Oklahoma. Um, oh wow! Visiting Henry and oh uh, yeah, <laughs> others. and so we went to a little microbrewery. It was really good. Oh really cool! Good. Do you remember the name of that one? Was it? I guess is that OSU or Oklahoma State University? Yeah, Henry Adams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't. It was sort of brick-like. Yeah, I, I can't remember. There's, there's like Mon Iron Monk. Was that the that the yeah, one? Yeah, I think it might have been Iron Monk. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's the one in Stillwater. Okay, so, so you got. I'm a beer and chips gal. S'mores, okay. disgusting. If I have dirty hands around a camp, like in the field, generally, <laughs> I'm just like unhappy camper. Yeah, so yeah. Totally dish s'mores. Mm -mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nothing you need to like lick your fingers afterwards. No. No, yeah. like I could get fancy and eat something nice around the campfire, but if you're just mm -hmm. noshing on some chips and drinking a beer, life's pretty good. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay, um, what's one thing that you would want some like people to, if they could take away from what you do or just kind of your experience? What is what is something kind of like? What is kind of the heart and passion behind what you do and what you want people to really understand? Um. I really think the role of disturbances is really underestimated um, in forestry, in dendrochronology, et cetera. And we can only see what we can see. And we can go, oh, we went to a stand that was undisturbed and we collected all these trees. Well, how do you know? Mm -hmm. The insects aren't there. At the time, you know, you're, you're collecting tree cores. Like, how do you really know? And so that role of sort of endogenous disturbance, I think is at the core of my work. Again, it's like, how do trees respond? Um, what can, what can tree rings tell us about things we cannot see? Um, I think people should just be really careful when they, when they are in these stands that have never been affected by anything except climate to remember that it's a big wide world out there um, pushing around on trees and they're responding to that. And so um, I have a colleague who jokes with me like, oh, you only said disturbance in that talk like 20 times. And I'm like, because it's important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, come on, get it. All right. disturbs dendro as a handle for Twitter. I, yes, I know. I wanted to point that out. I love your Twitter handle, disturbed dendro. Yeah. It's that, a double entendre as well, because I'm sort of disturbed, you know, partially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. That's, I wonder how many people like, you know, which, which side of that uh, coin they're going to, you know, prescribe to you. Is it, are you disturbed or are you a dendro that studies disturbance? Like what's going on? Well. There? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Cool. All right. Yeah, no, that's good. I like that. Um, let's see. So you already answered the, what you would say if you could go back in time. Was there anything else that you might say to younger Jody? You know, I wish, um, yeah, you know, I was like bad at math. I got told that in grade three or four or something. Mm -hmm. And so I got yeah, stranded at the dining room table by myself doing math that night because I had to get better at math. And then I had a horrendous science teacher in grade nine who like literally like busted out the overhead projector cellophane thingies, you know? Yeah. And just like twisted through his notes. Like the guy was on autopilot and he had a yeah. ministry. 
And I abandoned science completely. Oh, wow. By grade nine, I'm like, well, I clearly suck at this. I'm going to be a journalist or a writer, and I'm going to do the bare minimum required to mm-hmm. you know, graduate on the science and math front. And so I wish I had not made that decision. I wish I hadn't let those sort of narratives get in my head. Because, you know, out of all the things I do, it's sort of the statistics that make me really jumpy still. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you have a doctorate yeah. in using the statistics. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm still it. I'm pretty good at it. But, you know, it's still that place I feel a lot of discomfort. Um, yeah. So I sort of wish I had been maybe a little bolder as a kid and been like, okay, well, whatever. This is just one person. But, you know, adults, when you're a little kid, have quite a bit of sway in your life so oh yeah yeah power dynamic is definitely skewed there yeah yeah no that's great no i can definitely identify to that statistics you know i am not good at statistics i rely on a lot of learning in the moment not on the foundation that i built and everything else after that i have to really study it to you know get my numbers and really pull any significance out of things yeah it takes me a lot of work so I I can identify with that. And uh, yeah, I I think cool. It's really cool though, to me, I was actually, uh, my friend Bill was over here um, this weekend and uh, we're all vaccinated now, which I know you got one vaccine, right? Or did you get both? I got one. Yeah. We're a little behind here in Canada, but yeah, I got my first on Monday. I was really pleased. I teared up. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. I'm, I'm really happy for you doing that. But, you know, so we were able to get together and stuff. And, uh, you know, we were talking about how much sometimes it pisses us off when when people say, um, you know, well, you know, you've got all these communication skills or you can just, uh, you know, you're so natural at this. And Bill Bill is like, it pisses me off when people say that, because like, no, I worked at for him. He worked at Best Buy for 17 years. He worked himself up from, you know, nothing and had to overcome so much awkwardness and social anxieties to become able, you know, to yeah. be, to appear gifted and natural. And, you know, I, I think of, you know, like those of us who didn't just follow that typical uh, rigorous math and science and prep school and yada, yada, all the way through, you know, our PhDs, um, we developed a lot of other skills, you know, to compensate. And it really shows through, you know, in talking to you and, you know, seeing the work that you do, you know, you get that, that uh, extension job, you know, that wasn't because of all your incredible math skills, you know, you had exactly. to have all- Cause I could actually talk to people in a relatable right. way about what were bothering your trees. Cause Bill and I have a joke, like he's like, hashtag what kills trees. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, Bill, hashtag what bugs trees yeah <laughs> who done it does it matter <laughs> to us it does <laughs> yeah yeah no i love it i love it i love anybody that gives bill a hard time for what kills trees like i'm I'm all for it yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I always just tell him like it's you bill you're the you're the one that's killing all the trees around here you know because of yeah, all his totally. experiments yeah. yeah no that's cool <laughs> um how about if your older future self came back to you right now what would you hope that jody would say to you from the future what would my old wise self mm-hmm. say to my current self? Yep. Just be comfortable. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what your job is. Really, I work in science. I am so uh, blessed. I have a research scientist position. It doesn't matter if it's academia or government or the feds or the province or, um, you know, it doesn't matter. Do the work. Uh, just be comfortable. Know that you in some way have arrived. We're, we're always in a stage of arriving and yeah. it's, it's not, it's un, there's no future finish line to cross. Just, just do the work, be the best kind of mentor and colleague you can be, accept your limitations, accept when you drop balls and just get comfortable. I'm a little yeah. bit of like a, my uh, husband Peter often says, "Well, you're like a hot cat on a hot tin roof today." <laughs> you know, I started jumping. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
That's what I'd That's like good. to do. <laughs> yeah. And I damn well better be like that when I'm 60. So if I could kind of advance that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, you're right. We're always in a state of arrival. And yeah, maybe maybe you'll find yourself in that state of arriving at that point. Yeah. No, that's good. I like it. All right. Do uh, you have a book that you're reading right now or, or a favorite book or combination? You know, reading really fell off the chart for me in the PhD, I, I have yeah. to say. Can I say that I did not like the book Overstory? Yeah, you can say that for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so many I, people, I, like, oh like random people, like I was chatting to somebody at Berkeley, like in the dean's office, and they were like, oh, I'm seeing your signature. Have you read Overstory? <laughs> you know, and somebody, oh, have you read Overstory? Have you read Overstory? So yeah. I started reading it and <laughs> dang, it was just like a slog for me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't read it yet. but I, I've heard the same thing. I, I've heard people saying that they really liked it. But, you know, I'm glad you said that because... Well, first, first, do you have a do you have a favorite book or do you have a book that you do enjoy? Oh, yeah. I've got lots of books that I enjoy. I'm yeah. really on like been on the poetry train for the last number of years. And I just oh, love nice. everything by Mary Oliver. OK, just 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 absolutely love her. Reread her poems, reread her volumes. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so about Overstory, that reminds me. I was, uh, my brother had a wedding and, uh, I was at the wedding and sitting next to the, the person who officiated the wedding and, uh, he was from Colorado and had kind of been around forests and stuff. And so he, he, you know, really, we had a somewhat engaging conversation <laughs> and, uh, he, but, but it, but it stopped being engaging for me whenever he asked me if I read, um, oh, what is it? I'm going to get the title wrong. Is it hidden life of trees? Yeah, the, the, the yeah. one that's very anthropomorphic, you know, towards trees and my sister-in-law bought me that book. Okay, yeah, yeah I use it to prop up an iPad. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> 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 but you know, and, and like you know, he raved about the book, and and I I, I absolutely hated the book. Uh, I I listened to an audio book of it, and yeah, his voice was fine, you know, and everything, but uh, no, like. It just everything about it sat wrong, you know, and yeah. it just, oh, it was awful. But then I've heard like, you know, I have not heard very many scientists like the book, but I've heard a lot of just, you know, just your normal, you know, non-scientists like it. And I get that. I get yeah. that. But and that's exactly. what probably frustrates me even more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what they're getting into. But, you know, whatever. To each their own, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on fiction side, I will say. Wallace Stegner, he's not this really well-known off. I don't find like people like widely know about Wallace Stegner. Mm -hmm. He's really amazing. Okay. Um, he writes really beautifully about, uh, you know, the plains and sort of the American West. And I've started mm -hmm. to reread some Wallace Stegner books and um, thoroughly enjoying that. Oh, good. Well, I'll, I always, you know, it's funny. I always want to like find myself writing whenever people say this and I forget that it's recorded so I can just, <laughs> listen to it in a minute. <laughs> but okay. Yeah. I'll look it up. Wallace Stigner. Okay. Um, if you had to be a tree or plant, what would you be? Would it be the same as your favorite tree? Um, I want to say, yes, it would be the same as my favorite tree. Um, but I'm going to say no. Uh, Suzanne Simard has come out with a memoir called Finding the Mother Tree. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because that Hidden Life of Trees is a, a fairly massive distortion of yeah. her life's work. Yeah. Um, and so that role of a mother tree in a forest, I think, is really amazing. But I would actually say oak. I'd like to be a Gary Oak. We call them Gary, Gary Oak. Oaks. Um, here in British Columbia, um, Corcus Gariana. So I guess blue oak. Okay. That's what they're referred to as, are they referred to as blue oak? Well, there are some blue oak down here too that are not Gary, I think. I don't know. There's so many oaks and I don't always. It might remember. be Oregon blue oak is the U.S. Oregon blue oak. Yeah, yeah that's Oregon right. Oregon blue oak is the common that's name in the right. U.S. In B.C. we call it Gary oak based on, I guess, probably the fact that it's Latin as Garyana. That You know what? That's, yeah, actually, uh, probably somebody that you know pretty well 
or know of at least is uh, Kelsey Copes Gerbitz. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She was the one that told me about uh, Gary Oak. I had no idea that it was called Oregon Oak or Oregon Blue. I had never heard that. I just thought I knew Gary Oak, but I didn't know there was like a, a, a different common name, which is why common names can be confused. But you know. yeah. Well, cool. No, they're just really cool trees, I think. And I, I'm always really admiring of oaks. Yeah. You know, I don't Me know too. why Gary Oak today, but if I can't yeah. be a Mother Douglas fir tree, I would be a Gary Oak for sure. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay. Well, do you have uh, anybody who's been most influential um, or a group of people or anything like that in your, your personal science or whatever life? Oh yeah. Tons. Right. Like mm -hmm. my forestry hero right now is close Putnam at Oregon state university worked okay. a long time around these ideas of adaptive capacity and, yeah. you know, again, he's sort of like Suzanne, where a lifetime of work in civil cultural innovation is coming to fruition in these like really well conceived of whole picture argument, you know, um, mm -hmm. arguments about the way it could be. So, um, yeah, really like Klaus. Um, oh, man, there's so many people. Ann Lynch at the Tree Ring Lab and with the U.S. Forest Service has just been a great colleague and mentor on the entomology side. Um, got to work with Anne in Tucson for a couple of months on a Harry fellowship and mm. just really do a deep dive on budworm. You know, she's sort of at the full eater queen as it were. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. Oh, there's like, I feel like I'm just can't. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to miss like people, so many. Right? Sure. Like, yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> You know, um, I grew up with a really great family. I had an uncle in particular who just fed me books, like a steady diet of books as a kid. So did my parents, but he was just like constantly giving me books. And so that really created a love of reading and then later writing. And, you know, and in, in a sense, I am still a writer. It's just technical, right? Yeah, right. So um, kudos to him, to my uncle Greg for giving me lots of good books as a kid. Yeah, no, that's great. All right, well, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, do you have anything else you want to add or say before we kind of wrap it up? That's <laughs> a blank check. That's a, yeah, that's, 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 that's a, a horrible question, sorry. That's a big wide open. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh -oh. um, people who know me know I love a Wes Anderson palette in R. If you don't know about this, use it. It's amazing. You can make your grass be like Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay. Or Moonrise Kingdom has been a big one lately because I've been working so much in tree mortality. It's like the perfect palette. Okay. So don't forget about aesthetics. Make your grass look nice, folks. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just, you know, thanks to you. I think you do a really cool job of extending like great images and information and like the fireside chats and the social media space. And I've really, you know, enjoyed um, learning, you know, to the extent, because we should turn this around on you and somebody should do a fireside chat on you sometime um, to the extent that you ever know somebody on social media. Right. But yeah, in terms of like what you're posting and like sharing it, like your tree ring cookies, beautiful images are like, Oh, it's like self to my soul. And I've got like a lot of, <laughs> what feel yeah. like um, crazy meetings going on and get on Twitter real quick and go, Oh yeah. Joe posted a picture of a beautiful little cookie. So. Well, good. I, I am glad that is like the whole point of the, of it all. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, it resonates. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's self for my soul too, you know, getting to, I actually cut some more. I've got this cool new collaboration going on with, with somebody I, I, that I just got in touch with. And, uh, so I've got, I'm cutting some stuff for him and, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. So that'll be down the road. That'll be like a year out and I'll be able to like really talk about it. It'll be pretty cool stuff. So yeah. But until then I'll just keep posting, you know, tree ring, you know, pictures because they, yeah, they, they make us feel happy. <laughs> Well, yeah. thanks for that, Jody. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. no problem. I think I should uh, like offer some words of wisdom, but it's not going to happen. I don't feel no, I feel wise, I, just very human and imperfect. <laughs> that is wisdom that you shared that. Yeah. No, I, I'm glad I'm glad I made such a really horrible open-ended question because I'm glad you get to throw out the palette choices on R 
for Wes Anderson. <laughs> yeah, Phil, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to check that out too. Um, okay, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way? I'd say Twitter is a really good way to start. Um, my handle is at Disturbed Dendro. Um, I'm on <laughs> there enough. Not laugh about DM that. me, so start there, and then you know we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I look forward to having another chat with you down the road, too. And uh, hopefully one day meeting up, that'll be really nice. Exactly. All yeah. right. Well, well, Jody, it was great to chat with you, and I look forward to our next one. Okay, me too. Take care. All right, you too. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.